CES 2023 has come and gone, and NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD had had their fair share of BS to present us with. AMD's presentation was filled with lies and amateur mistakes, and NVIDIA's, as usual, had very few consumer-related announcements, with more BS thrown into the mix. There are a couple of interesting things to take notice of, though, so let's dive into all of the major announcements. Today's video is sponsored by URCDKeys.com. If you buy a retail Windows 10 key, you will probably spend $100 or more. But if you buy an OEM key using a service like URCDKeys, it will cost you less than $15 after you use the coupon code C25. The keys work globally, and if you want Windows 11, what I recommend you do is just buy Windows 10 and get a free upgrade while you can. Personally, I use Windows 10 Pro. Once you've made your purchase using one of the many different payment options available, you will instantly find your key in your purchased orders on the URCDKeys website. Click Get Keys and copy the key. Then after you've installed Windows, of course, press Start and search for Activate and click on Activation Settings. Then click Change Product Key, paste in the key and click Next. That's it. Quick and easy and cheap. And your Windows 10 is now activated. If you need Office 2021 professional, you can use the same 25% discount code C25 and get it for just $59.98. Since you're over there, check out the Black Friday sale for some great discounts on peripherals like lightweight gaming mice and controllers and some very affordable 60% mechanical keyboards. Thank you to URCD Keys for sponsoring today's video. Check the links in the video description to get your OEM Windows keys today. Let's get NVIDIA's presentation out of the way. Basically, NVIDIA announced the 4070 tie, which everyone knew was coming, and that was followed by reviews from the major tech publications out there, looking at aggregate performance at 4K, which should really be the target resolution for any GPU that costs more than $600. And we see the 4070 Ti within spitting distance of AMD 7900 XT, which has an MSRP of $100 more. To my surprise, there are one or two models available at MSRP a week after launch, even though the vast majority of models are going for between $900 and $1,100, which is simply absurd for a mid-range GPU. Even at MSRP, these prices would be insulting, and I think they are symptomatic of what looks to me like clear price fixing from both AMD and NVIDIA. For the 4070 Ti, NVIDIA was claiming up to three times the performance of a 3090 Ti, specifically specifically in Cyberpunk 2077, and on average what looked like close to two times the performance of a 3090 Ti. Guess what? On average, the 4070 Ti is actually 5% slower than a 3090 Ti. Now here we were debating if the worst GPU in history was the 7900 XT, the 4080 or the 7900 XTX, and Nvidia comes out to definitely end the discussion. The 4070 Ti is the worst GPU in terms of value ever launched. It's an aberration, and NVIDIA should be punished by consumers. And it turns out they are being punished as the cards are rotting in shelves. I know this will come as a shock, but people aren't paying $800 for a $400 card. One would question Jensen Huang's sanity here, but the reality is that when your competitor is AMD, you can price your cards at whatever price you want, because if consumers are spending around $1,000 for a GPU, they are certainly not going to risk it with AMD and their incompetence. So Nvidia is just running wild. AMD is happy to milk the fanboys. So again, this is price fixing at its finest. The other announcements from Nvidia include GeForce Now having a 4080 tier. I doubt anyone in my audience cares about that. And the laptop discrete GPUs, the 4050L all the way up to the 4090L. Now, if we look at Nvidia's website, we see that the 4090 mobile has 9,728 CUDA cores. What desktop card has that many CUDA cores? The 4080. So why is the mobile part called a 4090 then? The 4080 mobile has 7,424 CUDA cores, which is roughly the same as the desktop 4070 Ti. So basically what's happening here is that in the mobile space, Nvidia is moving every card down a tier while maintaining the same name, deceiving consumers. A 4090 mobile is nowhere near the performance of a 4090 desktop. 
it's not even in the same tier. Also, I wonder how the 4070 Mobile, which will probably be the most popular option, will perform with only 4608 CUDA cores and a 128-bit interface running 8GB of G6. Last Gen's 3070 Mobile has more CUDA cores and a wider bus and performs on par with a desktop 3060 Ti or even close to a desktop 6700 XT. I have a feeling this Gen's Nvidia Mobile parts will be leaving a lot of laptop buyers underwhelmed by the performance. Nvidia's anti-consumer behavior is completely out of control, but wouldn't you know it, someone else is working hard to top them. So moving on to AMD, where do I even start? If you thought the 7900's presentation a couple of months ago was a complete shit show, then you're in for a treat. So AMD opened with the Phoenix APUs, the Ryzen 7040s, which is aimed at thin and light laptops. So 8 cores and 16 threads boosting up to 5.2 GHz, built on 4 nanometer TSMC with RDNA 3 graphics. Sounds great on paper for an ultra-thin low wattage part, but one thing that's traditionally held back APU performance is the memory system. So to everyone's surprise, this tiny part includes a whopping 40 megabytes of cache, at least according to the first slides AMD showed the press. That's the same amount of cache as a desktop 7700X, which is a beast of a CPU for gaming from my own testing. How did they fit that much cache into such a small chip? Oh wait, it turns out it's not actually 40 megabytes of cache. In the CS press kit, it says it's half of that, 20 megabytes. That makes a lot more sense. But wait, it's not actually 20 megabytes of cache, because if we look at Anantac's article on it, it says that it's 24 megabytes of cache. But wait, if we go over to amd.com, again, it says that it's 40 megs of cache. I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm still not sure which number is correct. But at the end of the day, what matters is performance. And Lisa Su proudly showed the 7940HS beating the Apple M1 in multi-threaded workloads, AI workloads, thanks to the new Xilinx co-processing these chips, and also in gaming. Apple should be scared. Or should they? I mean, AMD was running that very presentation on a MacBook. So I guess if you really want something reliable at a critical event, don't use a Windows-based AMD laptop. Use a MacBook. That's what AMD does. At least according to Lisa Su, the laptop has more than 30 hours of battery life. Even though in the slide behind her, it clearly says that it's in video playback, not in general, as her statement would indicate. Next up were the mobile variants of the 7000 RDNA 3 GPUs, the RX 7700S and the 7600X. And judging by AMD slides, these are absolute beasts. With 32 teraflops of FP32, the 7700X should be significantly faster than a desktop 6900 XT, which has a theoretical performance of only 23 teraflops. Oh, it turns out those were actually the compute unit counts, not the teraflops. The amateur hour continues. Anyway, what everyone really wanted to see were the X3D variants of Zen 4, and AMD did deliver. So meet the Ryzen 7 7800X3D, which could be the new gaming king, and the Ryzen 7 7950X3D. I mean, there were so many mistakes in AMD's CS presentation that it's hard to take anything AMD says seriously. I think at this point everything that AMD discloses in their presentations should be disregarded until actual reviews come out. And that includes product names, specs, performance metrics. Pretty much everything AMD presents is not reliable information, either intentionally or accidentally. Speaking of which, in this corrected slide it says the 7950X3D does up to 5.7 gigahertz. Hertz, then why is the 7800X3D only hitting 5 GHz? That's a huge difference. We got our answer shortly after. The 7950X3D only has stacked cache on one of the CCDs, so the CCD without the 3DV cache is the only one that hits 5.7 GHz. But how does Windows or each application know which CCD to use? Here's some clarification from Tom's hardware. AMD is working with Microsoft on Windows optimization that will work in tandem with a new AMD chipset driver to identify games that prefer the increased L3 cache capacity and pin them into the CCD with the stacked cache. Other games that prefer higher frequencies, more than increased L3 cache, will be pinned into the bare CCD. AMD says that the bare chiplet can act
access the stacked L3 cache in the adjacent chiplet, but this is an optimal and will be rare. Yes, the chip with the extra L3 cache will run games at a slower speed, but most games don't operate at peak clock rates, so you should still get a huge performance benefit. Okay, well, it would have been nice for this to have been disclosed in the presentation, because it sounds like in the vast majority of games, if not all, there will be no reason to get the 7950X3D instead of the 7800X3D. I think hardware slash software co-design is a good thing, and it's nice to see Microsoft adapting to new advancements in CPU technology. But I suspect what will happen in practice is that there will be a list of games, either in the driver or in Windows 11, that will prioritize one CCD over the other when using the 7950X3D. I doubt this list will be updated every time a new game comes out. At best, it will be updated a few times a year when an important AAA game is released. And what happens to Windows 10 users? Will this whitelist be available to them as well? Also note that the TDP of the 3D stack variants is actually lower than the non-3D. So the 7950X3D is 120 watts only versus 170 watts on the 7950X. To me, that indicates that in prolonged workloads, so actual real-world rendering, I could see the 3D stack variant being slower than the non-3D, so possibly faster in boosts and gaming, but slower in multi-threaded. That's me speculating, but if that's the case, then the only 3D part that will make sense getting is the 7800X3D, because a 16-core part is still really only justifiable for a productivity build, and in those, it sounds like the non-X3D will perform better in prolonged workloads. I think overall, the addition of 3D stacking to Zen 4 will be a positive thing, but without knowing prices, it's difficult to say if it will be worth it. I also think the gains will be smaller than what AMD has shown. AMD is showing about 15% on average versus the 13900K at 1080p, but you wouldn't be buying this class of CPU to play at 1080p. Will there really be a noticeable difference at 4K, I wonder? Not to mention that the 13900KS is already 15% faster than the 7950X in some games like Cyberpunk 2077, so it's possible that even the 7950X 3D doesn't beat the 13 gen top SKU. Hopefully I'll get to test that myself soon. As far as pricing is concerned, I actually think it's possible that the 3D variants will come in at the original MSRPs of the non-3D variants. We're already seeing price drops for Zen 4, so that could mean Zen 4 3D will just slot in to where the non-3D were launched at originally. I think if AMD launches these with a $100 premium over the original MSRPs, like they did with the 5800X 3D, few people will take notice, given the high cost of entry into the AM5 ecosystem. After this, AMD spent almost an hour talking about AI, FPGAs and servers, which I think is misguided for what is effectively the consumer electronics show. You can always show those things at another time. This would have been a great opportunity to tease things like new desktop GPUs. So the 7800 XT and the 7700 XT, new advancements with FSR, etc. So what would have been otherwise an exciting announcement from AMD with these 3D stack chips ends up being overshadowed by AMD's own marketing incompetence. NVIDIA is running rampant with absurdly overpriced GPUs. So what about Intel? Well, the aforementioned 13900KS is a complete ripoff in my opinion. I don't see enough of a performance jump over the 13900K to justify the massive increase in price. In fact, I don't see a reason to upgrade from the 12900K, which if you tune correctly will be performing at around the same as a 13900K anyway. But there was one thing which I thought was really cool announced from Intel. So this is a regular PC system, in this case from a system integrator, but in addition to it having a 13900K as the base GPU, which will be running your games, it also has a NUC compute card, which has a 12900. So that secondary compute card can be used for streaming, for example. So the 13900K handles gaming and the 12900K NUC is running OBS. It sounds kind of whack, but I like the concept. In addition to the added processing power, you also get more I.O. from the NUC. So I could see this potentially even being a great workstation, especially if you can combine the two CPUs when rendering. I'm intrigued. I did try and customize a system in the CLX website and the most basic system was $4,000. The system with the two i9 
Philippines plus a 4090 was almost $7,000, so there's that. Intel also showed a handheld device, the One X Player, terrible name, but it does feature an OLED touch panel and a 9712th gen processor. Seems like an interesting alternative to the Steam Deck. So honestly, that was it from Intel. Now, one area where there were lots of interesting announcements were displays. LG announced a 27-inch 1440p 240Hz OLED, which looks to be incredible if you like playing PC games sitting in front of a desk, something I haven't done personally for years as I've been enjoying OLED for a long while now with a PC connected to the LG C9. If you still haven't experienced gaming on an OLED, I think this is a good stepping stone. It is $1,000, so not exactly affordable, but that's a thousand dollars much better spent than on a 7900 XTX or any other GPU at around that price. You should always prioritize upgrading your display over upgrading your GPU. Another display that caught my eye was the wireless, that's right, wireless 97 inch OLED, also from LG. This does 4K at 120 Hz wirelessly, so that means you don't have to run an HDMI 2.1 cable from your PC to your TV. Hopefully LG will bring this tech to smaller size panels, as this can mean that you can have your PC in your bedroom or gaming setup, but still have it connected to your living room OLED without the need for a long cable or drilling through walls. I wonder what this does to response times, but sending video signals wirelessly could be a game changer for PC gamers. Another very interesting technology was the Samsung slidable panel. Having a mobile phone that can slide to the size of a tablet would be awesome. I'm curious to see where this tech will go. So CS 2023 was pretty disappointing in my opinion, with AMD and Nvidia not announcing anything particularly exciting and filling their presentations with lies. Nowadays you can just outright lie and get away with it. Whether you're a corporation or a YouTube leaker, just lie, no one seems to care. Well, I do care, and I think this CS just confirmed what most of us already suspected. This generation of hardware is a skip. The GPUs are a skip, and the CPUs are a skip. If you need PC components to play games or work, just stick to last gen and show these corporations that PC enthusiasts are not the idiots that they think we are. Well, at least I hope so. This video was made possible by my awesome patrons. By supporting my channel on Patreon, you will gain access to the Cortex Discord server, where you can talk to me directly and join a welcoming community of tech enthusiasts. If you can't contribute at this time, then give this video a like and share it, as that really helps. Thanks for watching, and until the next one.